The natural world may be divided in a number of different ways. One possibility is the division into ecosystems. An ecosystem is composed of a community of various organisms that interact with one another and their surrounding environment. With such a broad definition, ecosystems often overlap, and their scale can vary considerably. Some are quite large, encompassing hundreds of square miles. Others can be remarkably tiny. Some of the smallest ecosystems are those found upon and within a single organism. In the case of humans, for example, we have specific sorts of microbes and other creatures that live mainly on our skin or in our digestive tract. Thus, although every human is a part of their surrounding ecosystem, each human is also something of an ecosystem unto themselves, a metaphorical island within a surrounding ocean. For today, I would like to focus upon a much smaller ecosystem that happens to be particularly unusual. It is inhabited by hundreds of different species, many of which exhibit rather exotic forms of biochemistry and are found nowhere else on Earth. The environment is radically different from the immediate surroundings, even though this ecosystem is only a millimeter or two across. I am speaking of the bizarre realm that exists within the gut of a typical termite. Termites are familiar enough to most people, at least in a passing sort of sense. These little social insects are notorious for devouring wood, and some species can cause serious amounts of damage to various wooden structures. The capacity for wood digestion is typically made possible by one of two sorts of adaptations. In the colonies of higher termites, workers collectively tend a symbiotic fungus that breaks wood down and acts as the insect's food source. In contrast, lower termites rely upon symbiotic protists and prokaryotes located within their digestive system. The actual details are a bit more complicated, but this basic distinction is adequate for our purposes here. My focus for today is on the lower termites, especially the subterranean termites. A common example of this sort of creature is the eastern subterranean termite, Reticulatermes flavipes, this species has been extensively studied, as it is one of the foremost economic pests in North America. The colonies can grow quite large. Their dining alone is destructive enough to begin with, but they also have a habit of carrying moisture up from the ground into a structure. This causes fungal proliferation and hastens wood decay. Before considering these little creatures as living ecosystems, let us consider some of the traits of ecosystems in general. One of the easiest patterns to pick out is the food web, whereby energy and chemicals are transferred between the various species within the local community. It is a relatively easy way to conceptually organize this community, giving each species a role of sorts within the larger system. The food web may be understood in terms of both chemicals and energy. There is always an energy source for any given ecosystem, and in most cases this source is ultimately the sun. Sunlight drives photosynthesis, which converts solar energy into chemical energy. Various creatures consume the photosynthesizers, using the captured chemical energy to keep their own systems running. Another ecosystem pattern is the local climate. Things like temperature and rainfall are significant factors on land, while light, salinity, and dissolved nutrient levels tend to be quite important in aquatic systems. A division into various habitats is another feature. For example, a forest may be regarded as an ecosystem, but the canopy, the forest floor, and the soil below are each distinct habitats. As these habitats are connected, and the creatures within them interact a good deal, they are usually regarded as parts of a shared ecosystem. That being said, an ecosystem is defined by its boundaries. A forest canopy may be considered as an ecosystem unto itself from a certain point of view. A river flowing through a forest might be regarded as a part of the forest ecosystem or as a distinct ecosystem all its own. One of the easiest self-contained ecosystems to conceptualize would be an island. Yet even here, the island inhabitants interact with the surrounding water to at least some degree. Thankfully, such ecological boundaries are easy enough to establish where termites are concerned. 
For the moment at least, let us consider this tiny ecosystem to consist of everything within the bounds of the termite's body. Broadly speaking, this can be subdivided into the habitats of the termite tissues and the spaces within the termite's digestive system. One might also consider the surface to be a habitat of sorts, as certain mite species are known to live on termites. Within the termite digestive system, the spaces can be further divided into the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. In lower termites, the hindgut is much larger than what is seen in most insects. This expanded hindgut is home to the vast majority of resident microbes. The climate within this hindgut is highly unusual due to two main factors. Both of these factors involve the concentration of dissolved gases within the environment. Like other animals, termites require oxygen gas to survive, and there is a fair amount of the stuff within the termite tissues. It is continuously supplied to the termite by a system of microscopic air tubes that connect to the atmosphere outside. Within the hindgut, particularly at its center, there is an extremely low concentration of dissolved oxygen. There is a gradient around the edges of the gut, from the relatively high oxygen levels in the gut wall, to steadily lower oxygen as one travels deeper inside the lumen, with the middle being essentially anaerobic. This is vital for the resident microbes, as higher oxygen concentrations are lethal to many of these creatures. There is a second gradient for a different sort of substance. As a part of their metabolism, some of the microbes, protists in particular, produce hydrogen gas. This dissolved hydrogen is consumed by some of the bacterial species, leading to a gradient that is more or less the reverse of the oxygen gradient. In other words, there is a lot of dissolved hydrogen in the middle of the gut, and less and less as one travels out to the edges. There is virtually no dissolved hydrogen within the surrounding termite tissues. So, with this layout in mind, let us consider some of the unusual biochemistry in this miniature realm. To begin with, the driving energy source for this ecosystem is the wood the termite consumes. Therefore, to understand the food web, we must understand at least a little bit of wood chemistry. Apart from water and a few volatile chemicals, wood is mostly made up of three things. Lignin, hemicellulose, and cellulose. Lignin is a complicated branching polymer with lots of aromatic components, basically chemical cousins to the benzene molecule. It's probably the closest natural equivalent to plastic, and it is extremely difficult to break down. Most termites can't even manage it. The various hemicelluloses are several different sorts of polysaccharide. Xylan would be a common example found in wood. Every polymer is made up of various monomers, and a polysaccharide is a polymer made up of sugar molecules. Xylan consists of a chain of a type of sugar molecule known as xylose. Cellulose is another polysaccharide made up of glucose molecules. More specifically, it is a polymer of beta-glucose. This is in contrast to starch, which is a polymer of alpha-glucose. Basically, alpha and beta-glucose are two slightly different configurations of a glucose ring. As it happens, the functional groups found on a cellulose chain are arranged in a very particular pattern. This arrangement allows them to closely interact with the functional groups on a nearby cellulose chain by hydrogen bonding. In certain regions, adjacent chains of cellulose end up locked together in remarkably tight patterns. This structure is highly ordered, like a sort of organic crystal. Indeed, it is often referred to as crystalline cellulose. Wherever the individual cellulose chains are bonded together like this, it is extremely difficult for digestive enzymes to get at them. This is what makes cellulose impossible for most creatures to properly break down. In wood, and plant cell walls in general, the cellulose contains amorphous regions where the chains are somewhat random, and crystalline regions where they align quite closely. A type of digestive enzyme known as endoglucanase attaches to an individual cellulose chain somewhere along its length and splits it in two. This allows for a partial breakdown of the amorphous cellulose, where the chains are fairly far apart from one another. However, the crystalline cellulose is out of reach as far as this enzyme is concerned. A different sort of enzyme known as an exoglucanase is required to handle this stuff. 
An exoglucanase latches on to one end of a cellulose chain and moves steadily along its length, chopping it up as it goes. A few exoglucanase enzymes working together can tease the crystalline cellulose apart one strand at a time, allowing it to eventually be broken down. Still, exoglucanases do not work alone. Endoglucanases chew through the amorphous cellulose to give the exoglucanases a starting point to work from as they pry apart the crystalline cellulose. When these enzymes are finished with their work, what remains are a lot of short chains of beta-glucose. This is where a third enzyme comes in. Beta-glucosidases can't really break down long cellulose chains, but they're great at breaking down these short chains. The end result is glucose, and that is handled quite readily by most cells. A typical lower termite is able to produce its own endoglucanases and beta-glucosidases, but it doesn't have the genetics to make exoglucanases. However, several of the protists in the termite hindgut can make these vital enzymes, as well as the others that collectively break down cellulose. Of course, there is a mechanical aspect to digestion as well as a chemical aspect. The wood that enters a termite hindgut does so in the form of several microscopic fragments, thanks to the processing of the mouthparts and a few internal structures. A termite's mandibles are sharp enough to scrape bits of wood from larger pieces. It is worth noting the dark color of the cutting edges of these mandibles. In insects, the exoskeleton is hardened after molting, and the hardening process is accompanied by a darkening side effect. This is why freshly molted insects are often rather pale. Additional pigmentation aside, a darker piece of exoskeleton is a harder, tougher piece of exoskeleton. It should be no surprise to find the cutting edges of a termite's mandibles to be the darkest, toughest parts of its body. Within the termite, the gut consists of a foregut with associated salivary glands, a midgut, and the enlarged hindgut. Right at the back of the foregut, there is a small proventriculus, otherwise known as a gizzard. This gizzard is lined with microscopic teeth that chew the wood fragments into smaller pieces. By the time they arrive at the hindgut, these fragments are small enough for the local protists to handle. Next time, we will look more closely at these protists, as well as some of the other microbes that make their home in the termite hindgut. We will look into what happens after the wood fragments are broken down, and how these little creatures survive the strange catastrophes that regularly befall them. Thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this brief glimpse into the more unusual side of the natural world. If you wish to know more, here are a few things that might be worth looking into. If you found this enjoyable, feel free to leave a like. If you think others would enjoy this content, by all means, share. If you have something to say or ask about, honest comments are always welcome. If you wish to see more from this channel, a subscription would be most helpful. Until next time.